Well, as it turns out, it's time to start the panel. And if you don't mind, I'll start by reading the pre -C. There have been stories written about the thing that happened in times of disease and pandemic. Here we are in the midst of one. What did the stories get right? What did the stories get wrong? And what things happened that surprised us all? I'm Herb Cowder. I'm a professor of English, as well as a writer of science fiction and fantasy and horror. And I have a distinguished uh, panel of guests, and we even have five attendees. So I'll ask you all to introduce yourself, starting with Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Trisillo. I went on Nebula once. Uh, it was not about a pandemic. I wrote a novel that had a plague in it once. It was a prion plague. Uh, which is pretty scary, except I think prions don't spread as readily as uh, viruses do, especially coronaviruses, uh, but it's not published yet. Uh, and my latest novel is uh, Mars Girls, but I have one in the pipe right now called uh, A Mars Cat and His Boy, which I hope is, will be out for, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you for, the, uh, uh, for uh, the year of the cat, which is coming right up. And uh, I write poetry and I also, I also fence, which is weird. Uh, I, like something physical and something mental and something social. And so I got all three things and I can't keep up with it. <laughs> Bud, please introduce yourself. I'm Bud Sparhawk. I'm a short story writer. I've got a couple novels out there on Amazon that uh, you might want to read in your spare time. Mention them, mention them, mention them. Let him don't, talk, Mary. Don't pressure, don't pressure <laughs> me. <laughs> My memory is bad enough as it is. <laughs> Uh, my most recent one was uh, Shattered, Shattered Dreams from, uh, yeah, and uh, I've got a collection out there which I'm very proud of called uh, Non-Parallel Universes, which got some very good critical acclaim from uh, Locus of all places, which usually hates my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I've uh, written a few short stories for Analog and some other magazines and uh, appeared in a couple anthologies not my own. And uh, I guess that's about it. And Marie. I'm Marie Vibbert. I write short stories. And also, I have a novel coming out next year, March 2021. Look for Galactic Hellcats, um, which is about a female biker gang in outer space rescuing a prince. Um, I ha yeah, I haven't written anything with a pandemic in it, but I'm definitely writing in a pandemic. Um, and I think that it's really showed like how the books that I read didn't prepare me for this. Stephen King did not prepare me for this. As it turns out in July, <coughs> excuse me, um, I had a blog on the Asimov's blog uh, and I was talking about pretty much exactly what the pre -C asked. And one thing that I offered is that none of the pandemic literature that I saw told us about Brady boxing, right? Here we are and we're in our little boxes, just like the beginning of the Brady Bunch. And we're all learning how to be more gesture oriented and how to do interesting things with our heads and our faces. So people are getting the communication exactly so that we lack in other places. Um, it is perhaps the most obvious symptom, but it is not necessarily one of the important ones. Uh, what are you guys thinking of? What did it miss? Scope. This is going to be non-political, right? Oh. I, <laughs> I mean, the nobody, nobody in the stand is saying, but is this plague really killing humanity? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think the one thing that most, uh, most of the plagues novels and, and short stories that I've read is this idea of a mass panic. It's not happening. People are expressing their fears in different ways. Uh, and if I think it wasn't for social, social, uh, uh, and social interchange, we'd all be going batshit right now. <laughs> I appreciate that, that idea that uh, maybe these, uh, these Zoom sessions are actually helping us. I note that uh, I'm touching back on Mary's comment about where we, we entered this in different technological uh, uh, preparedness, right? So I was already on 
uh, whatever that other thing is we're using there. So I was on Skype and Discord and Twitch and all these other things because I'm, you know, from many generations of techno geeky people. My mom is 86 and uh, uh, she is totally into her computers and doing things online and so on and so forth. Uh, other people have been dragged kicking and screaming and are zooming on their phone because it's the only thing they have. <laughs> and that's a very different kind of concept. Well, there's definitely the idea that the future is never equally distributed. Um, when uh, I work, my day job, I work for Case Western Reserve University as a computer programmer. And when they announced that in two weeks they were going to turn all the classes virtual, every IT person from the front desk phone support to people like me, to the server supporters, um, we all had to jump in and teach all of these professors, some of whom were very resistant, just how to use Zoom. Um, but definitely one of the things that I think ties together a lot of pandemic narratives that we've read is the idea of the end of the world. It's often not about the pandemic. It's using the pandemic as a jumping off point to end civilization, like uh, Station Eleven or uh, Brief History of the Dead. Um, they're really stories about, gee, I wish that society would end so I don't have to go to work on Friday. <laughs> um, that's that's the, the hidden joy in end of the world literature that we don't talk about, right? We're all like, yeah, I know how to grow vegetables and, and I'm really good with an ax. I'd be the king and my supervisor will be going, help me, Marie, help me. I don't know how to start a fire. But really, we're in a pandemic that is not ending the world. And in a way, that's more, that's more interesting. It's more complicated, right? It's we're not work. just dealing with the pandemic. We're dealing with the pandemic and our day job or struggling to keep our day job and educating our kids and all the responsibilities. One of the things I, I as I was just doing a little bit of research for this panel uh, that I was a little entertained by, I don't know if entertained is the right word, uh, but I actually started looking at some of the ancient chronicles of plagues and I started with the Bible. And when I was reading the 10 plagues of Egypt, I thought, holy cow, this is 2020. <laughs> and one of the things that's of interest is one of the things they're trying to do is narrow down specifically what are these plagues? What exactly is happening? And that's happening, I would say, right now in society, and particularly in American society, people aren't really dealing well with the way science works, the idea that your target changes and it's supposed to be self-correcting and we're gonna figure things out. And of course, we have people obscuring the science and arguing against the science. So, uh, very interesting. Mary, you look like you wanna talk. Well, I, I was, I, was all, all, I just think I wanna jump on what Marie said. I think all of the, I've, I've read a lot of play uh, novels and th things like that. Um, and it, it seems like they, the plagues go too fast. They just completely wipe out humanity right away or not wipe it out, but reduce it to like 1% of its previous and, and create a, a lot more disruption than we've had. And the types of, of, of adaptation and disruption, I'd say that's almost true of almost all disaster literature is that it immediately reduces people to um, your neighbor has a gun and he's going to shoot you, so you've got to be in your bunker and you should, you know, try to find a gun and you can trade cigarettes. And um, I find that people are a lot more, and I'm not talking, I'm talking about all people, including the science rejectors, are a lot more adaptable. They, you know, okay, they come up with this and if they see somebody that needs help, maybe they're not going to go up to them because they might catch the plague from them, but they do try to help in some way or other. There's, you know, charitable giving and stuff like that. And I think a lot of plague narratives, like Marie said, they're actually sort of fantasies about now I don't have to go to my job. Um, I, I think they underestimate human ingenuity and, and human kindness. I just want to say that you know, one of the things that occurred to me going into this, uh, partly because I have one friend who's absolutely loving the pandemic, 
He's pretty <laughs> antisocial and likes to stay home and do his things. And I thought, My sister, she's well, loving it too. Isn't this the lesson of the Canterbury Tales? Is that for a writer, what a great idea. Let's all flee our day jobs and go tell stories. <laughs> yeah, I know a dermatologist, uh, my, my niece-in-law is a, uh, a Mo surgeon and she, she, at the beginning of it, I don't know if she still feels the same way now because she still has to work. People still get skin cancer. Um, but she said it was the great pause. She was just, and at the beginning of it, don't you remember sort of like, all of a sudden you said, oh, I don't have to go to work. Oh, that science fiction convention, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but now I can just stay home. Uh, and that, at the beginning of, of this plague, this pandemic, I think that was, that was something that I happened. Think, yeah, I think what I miss uh, as far as the conventions go in, in this is the inability to meet new people, mm -hmm. to exchange things, to see, just to see people. You know, I, I, I live in a bubble. Uh, the community here is isolated from the larger city of, of Richmond, and we have very strict protocols in place. So seeing more than three people walking outside is like, oh, a crowd. <laughs> 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 but, you know, the, the other thing as a writer is I always, I always wanted this to happen. I wanted to have time where I was forced to be on my own for a long period of time and I could write and write and write and write and write. Now that it's happened, I find I can't write. Uh, I don't yeah, know I was like, how's that working for you, bud? Not stimulated enough, I guess. Not but, stimulated enough. There's an interesting view and something we didn't necessarily expect out of, out of the pandemic. And I will toss out that one of the things I was writing about for the Asimov's blog which I call the new inequality, is that there's two kinds of inequalities that we uh, uh, have, and one of them is the whole work versus time. So I had to work a lot more. When we went online teaching on March 15th, suddenly I went from working 50 hours a week to working 75 hours a week, because of course there was no plan in place and so on and so forth. And then when the semester ended, they wanted us creating backup online uh, courses oh. of, of every course in the spectrum. So we created 180 online courses over the summer so that wouldn't happen again. And, you know, nicely they paid us extra for that and all that, uh, which oh, is- they paid you extra? Believe it or not. Yeah, IT didn't get nothing. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so this I idea that some people have more money because they're working more than ever, some people have less money, because they're not working. Some people have more time than ever. Some people have less time than ever. And then that final inequality is um, antibodies. So I had COVID back in February. And uh, before my semester started, I went ahead to and, and had the antibodies test to see if they were still active. Um, because I know they tend to fade away after about two months. And for me, it had already been six months. So I did not have active antibodies. But the preliminary results on reinfection are that it mimics a lot of other diseases and almost 80% of reinfection cases are asymptomatic. You, there is a level of viral, of uh, cellular uh, immunity that's, uh, that's making it possible to spread it without feeling it, which is very scary to me. So it's a few more ideas. One of the things that occurred to me on this plague is I, I found myself looking at the dispersal of the, uh, of, the, of the COVID across the country. You see the cities growing and growing. And I was reminded of uh, the bells ringing in Connie Willis's uh, Black Oh, uh, the Duke Hearing the bells from the distance and, and knowing that the plague is coming. And looking at these maps, you sort of had the same effect, the same horrifying effect, I should say. I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> the question of the panel, Parisi. What did they get right? What did they get wrong? I know that for me, one of the most creative, and this was earlier in my reading career, but one of the most creative plagues, uh, apocalyptic plagues, was in Spider Robinson's first novel, Telempath, where a plague uh, wipes out our natural ability to screen out our senses, and in particular, smell. So the sense of smell is heightened up a hundred times, and this brings about the downfall of society. I thought that was wildly creative and interesting because it made me think about something I'd never thought about. I mean, I laughed about the fact that uh, before in-person classes started in late August, 
I still like put on deodorant for every Zoom meeting because why would I want to get out of the planet, <laughs> right? You know, so on and so forth, right? So uh, and pants maybe at least okay. shorts, right? I have one friend who's to every Zoom meeting he's at, he's wearing underwear, and that's it. You know, underwear and a shirt. Like really, Sean? <laughs> well, I think. A lot of the fictional pandemics, they just have a greater scope. And some of that is just unrealistic immunologically, right? They, they want to be 100% kill rate, 100% catch rate. Um, you can almost feel them arguing against the reader, like, no, everyone's going to get it. We're not going to stop it. Um, and... I don't know. I kind of feel for those authors today as I see people denying that, that it's not a problem. My own father was like, nobody I know has it. I'm like, dad, you live in the country. You, you see eight people a day. I live in the city and I have friends who are recovering, friends who have lost loved ones. You know, yes, it's real. Stop counting the number of people I know who died of COVID at 28. Yeah. I said, I'm, I need my own mental health to not be depressed by this. Yes. I will, I will have a sip of coffee or a beer in their honor and move on. So one thing I'm a very gregarious guy, unlike your dad. One thing, I don't know whether they got it wrong. They got it wrong, but something that sort of surprised me is uh, the first thing that happened is they said, oh, well, the general public should not wear masks. Okay, and I, I'm not going to argue about that, you know, whether it was right or wrong or whatever. They wanted to, to preserve the N95 masks for medical personnel, whatever, whatever. But then the next day, the newspapers started printing um, patterns to make masks, and you could make them, they said, you could make them out of old underwear, you could make them out of old sheets, you know, old, old dish towels, you know, this is how to do them, this is, you know, you, you can get the elastic from this, that, or the other thing, you can use pipe cleaners, everything like that. So about three days later, you go online, I, I walk into the grocery store, I walk into the and there's a woman wearing a mask, and it's, it has flowers all over it, and I thought, yeah. And then I go online and my sister says, look what my friend Marilyn made for me. And it's a, it's a mask with a dog on it, everything like that. And, you know, like the day after that, you go online and Etsy has probably about 10,000 people that make masks. Mask fashion? How cool, yeah. you know? I mean. Oh, yeah. My pizza delivery lady had, had a sequined mask. I was Ooh. like, disco fever. I'm here for it. <laughs> Yeah, truly, like, I, I've read things where masks were required. Out, you but, do get cultural moments in the plague, right? We yeah. have mask fashion. We're learning new terms are popular. Social distancing is a term now that we all understand. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know. We're all stepping off the sidewalk when somebody comes towards us. Yeah. Well, Zoom and Brady boxing are new words too, right? I never heard Brady boxing before. That's cool. Zoom ate Skype's lunch. I'm yeah, telling you. It really did. <laughs> um, and I've actually heard people. With my mother-in-law in Vietnam, and now we Zoom. <laughs> it's like, have you heard of this Zoom thing? <laughs> I've just heard Brady boxing since April, so it's certainly not new with me. The other thing that's kind of neat is... Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about, I'm not in favor of the pandemic. It's not that, but we used to be, there was a, I have a double identity. I'm also a fencer, which you probably know if you looked at my, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I mentioned it before, but I, at one time. Contact was, sport. Well, it, I was the, yeah, it, it is a contact sport. Actually, it's, it's shut down and fencers tend to be pro science. So they're a little bit more shut down than a lot of other sports. Anyway, so at one time I was the sixth best woman foil fencer in my age group, which is old. Um, <laughs> and so we couldn't go to poetry readings. There were a lot of things we couldn't go to. Now, you know, um, there's a poetry reading on Thursday night and we can go to it. It's the other side of town. All we have to do is press a button and we're there. And in fact, we could go to poetry readings on the West Coast if we wanted to. We couldn't do that before. Yeah, I wasn't going to go to the Nebulas this year because it was in LA, but instead I ended up on staff mm -hmm. as it was on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that we're learning that virtual socializing does work. I mean, Zoom fatigue is real too. Mm -hmm. um, but 
last night I logged into the Discord and I ended up chatting with somebody I don't know um, because we were both logged in and we were like, how does this work? And I'm like, oh, we're just like the awkward people walking into the hotel saying, are you here for the convention? I can't <laughs> tell. You are? Oh, good. We're friends now. Um, <laughs> I never heard of Discard until day before yesterday. Oh and, yeah. And my, my computer won't support it. So I've got to, I really have to buy a new computer. I really have to buy a new computer. Yeah, Discord is similar to Slack. And I never heard of Slack before either. <laughs> it shows me, I'm like one of your, I'm like one of your professors. Case Western, case Western faculty that resists, 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 except I'm not resisting, I'm just ignorant. No, and actually some of the faculty, like, you know, some of them were very committed and jumped both feet in. And I'm not even going to say it was an age thing. I had a 70-year-old professor in the economics department who was like, can I do this? Can I do that? How does the whiteboarding feature work? Did you know there's a whiteboarding feature in Zoom? There is. Um, and then they're like a 25-year-old adjunct in, you know, mathematics was like, I don't understand why we can't just do a phone call. Can we do a phone call? <laughs> so the different levels of comfort and availability of, and I think also there's people who are gadgeters. It's people who just love the new gadgets. So here's my thing, and it ties right into the gadgeters and stuff. I totally didn't get this out of, of what would happen in a pandemic. So my school is a, small private liberal arts school and everybody who's there is there because they love what they're doing right we're the lowest paid faculty in new york state in our class yeah. um so the pandemic comes and the it department which is also there because they love it suddenly realizes they're worth like a quarter of a million dollar more than the forty they they're getting where i teach and all but one of them leaves and the one guy who stays is the gadgeteer the hardware guy it's like I drop a little email after he would leave on Friday saying, low priority, the speakers in Pachesney 204 are distorted. And by Monday night, he's like, I put a whole new system in. Thanks for letting me know. It was, you know, it was on my list, but very low. I didn't know they weren't working. Um, it's, he's kind of in, I, he's like worked himself into losing 40 pounds over the summer because he's doing so much, but he seems to be happy about it. So, but as far as the other ones suddenly realizing how valuable their IT skills are, who stopped to think that a pandemic would make us stay home and therefore would make IT so valuable? Hmm. Right? Yeah. There's an old novel. This is not a plague novel, I don't think. It's called Planet of the Dreamers. It was by James D. McDonald, who is, you know, probably as a, as a detective novel. And it's about basically a world in which everybody has gone virtual. They are basically uh, become sort of like slug bodies connected to, uh, you know, catheters and IV forms, and they're they're living in basically uh, a, a, an imaginary world. And how this is not a good thing, although I don't know whether it was a good thing or not. And I wonder whether maybe there's no indication. I don't remember. I haven't read the novel for I think 40 years, but. I can't remember if there was any explanation how, of how it started. I'm wondering whether maybe it started with the pandemic where everybody had to stay home and go on Zoom. I don't know. Well, looking for that, it's, it's John D. McDonald rather than the newer uh, author, James. And uh, it's been published under two titles, Planet of the Dreamers and Wine of the Dreamers. Wine of the Dreamers, yeah. So. I never reread it. I, I remember I, I was like a teenager. I was, you know, I could even go into the library in at Revere High School and, you know, pick it off the shelf. I know exactly where it was. It was down at the bottom there. You know, the people I feel bad about is the editors of science fiction and fantasy magazines who will get an absolute landslide of poorly written <laughs> prose. As a result of this, because everybody, everybody will say, "Oh, I can, I can type here on Zoom. So why don't I write a story?" and just plunge in and produce something that's uh, hardly acceptable. And There's among those are little, little nuggets of gold that are going to be discovered. Yeah, but, yeah uh, I think a lot of magazines have reported increased submissions. <laughs> um, and I find it interesting because again, I haven't, I've, I've, my productivity has gone down greatly as a writer because of stress, because of increased work hours. Um, and but, and it's funny too, because if we're not going out, if we're not doing events, don't I have more free time now? 
And if so, where did it go? Can I have it back? Don't you find you have to do things to, to adapt to the pandemic? Don't you have to, I don't know. Um, well, you have to do Zoom, obviously. Uh, but don't you yeah. find that like- Yeah, you, obviously you, I'm doing way more meetings at work because everyone's watching on and see what I'm doing. Um, they can't just walk by my cubicle. You froze up on us, Marie. Yeah, say oh, again. did I? Can you see me now? Your image froze up and your audio became distorted. Could be a little buffering. Yeah, let me, give me a second. Let me try sure. Hey Mary, I, I just note that when you don't eat out, like you cook a lot and then you clean up after cooking a lot, right? Yeah, and the shopping doesn't go down. You still have to do it. And frankly, I find it very difficult to shop online. It's because it, the, the, the you know that this is in the store because you could go to it immediately and grab it and it's something you really need and it costs $1.95, but for some reason or another, Instacart doesn't have it because nobody wants it, they think. Oh, I hate, I hate shopping online. I've gotten more time because I don't fence because they, they stopped. Uh, I'm, I, I don't go to classes anymore. I know there are, there are people that are doing physical education and uh, physical activity and gyms and things like that, but I just, not me. I'm not going to do it. It's I, not I would think a sport that required people to keep a minimum of four feet distance. No. Would be and they all wear masks. I don't understand. <laughs> to make the touch, you have to be within two feet. Oh, saber. You have to make the touch. And the touch, the, uh, the uh, well, actually, maybe call it three feet, but the, the, your weapon is uh, basically a meter long. So when you make the touch, and you usually, it bends, so that does it more. And very frequently, there's what they call core a core, which is you run into the person. And they're breathing heavily, and you're breathing heavily. And don't think that the fencing mask is any protection at all. I have been to a, I've been to to a, to a to an outdoor tournament, which is the only way I will compete. And I've been uh, taking outdoor classes occasionally, um, but there's still a danger. So I don't do it. I'm. Well said. I want to be alive at the end of this thing. And I have yeah. a, a good friend died at the very beginning of this, and she was my age, and. Uh, and she died of COVID. And that makes you more sensitive to the fact mm -hmm. that it could really happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's this sense, and this was expressed to me by a military veteran talking about um, conflicts, military conflicts. He said, mm -hmm. one of the things that happens is back in your country, people start making their own scenario about what's happening. Mm -hmm. And that can only last until there are enough returning veterans that everyone knows one and then they can no longer make up stories about what it's like. And I find that the pandemic is very much like that. People who don't know anyone who's died of COVID have a very different view than people who know people who died of COVID. There's that idea that, okay, in November I was selling my house and my realtor was a friend and he was sitting in my kitchen giving me shit about the Raiders because he's a Las Vegas Raiders fan and, and three months later he was dead. Right. And that's very visceral. You feel that this is the person who is in my kitchen talking football with me. Um, and it changes everything ab about the way you think about that sort of thing. Um, and, and so, of course, those of us who've had the experience and had the experience earlier uh, are much more into the sense of what does this mean? And could it happen to me? And who could it happen to? I mean, uh, when the decision was made, when I agreed to teach in person, even with excellent protocols, and my school's doing great, right? We have one COVID case in two months now. But I immediately told my mother and my sisters that, okay, I'm not going to see you until December, until I'm at least quarantined after a semester seeing students. Because why would I ever want to take a chance? So, We're also seeing, one of the things that the pandemic novels got right that I wish that they hadn't is the disproportionate impact on the poor um, and the working class and how quickly um, people went from being unskilled labor to essential worker. Uh, <laughs> what a great observation. Uh, yeah, and, and you, you noticed quickly, like the less you made, the more likely you were to be forced to come in. Um, and another quote I saw was a friend saying, wow, before this, I only thought my boss didn't care if I lived or died. Now I know. 
-hmm. that mm -hmm. my safety is not a priority at all. Um, and there's people who, you know, had rough decisions to make about, um, do I work the library front desk, you know, or do I, you know, lose my, my source of income, even though I'm an at-risk person and I don't feel that the library is limiting um, people coming in enough. So, yeah, I don't know. Libraries in particular have been a point of contention because libraries are so necessary and they serve an at-risk population. Um, and there's been a lot of push to keep libraries open or to open libraries um, perhaps too soon. And also Libraries were one of the first things to reopen here. And um, I'm actually in a hot spot. I'm about two miles from where the Buffalo Bills play football um, and about a mile and a half from the east coast of Lake Erie. And uh, we're, you know, constantly negotiating for anything because right now Erie County, New York is the COVID hottest place in the state, far more so than New York City. And that's not generally known. Everybody's thinking 10 hours away in New York City. Um, so we're really literally negotiating a lot of things all the time, which is also something I don't really remember seeing in any pandemic literature I've read. Um, that idea of, of a negotiation about what you could do. It was always, it was always authoritarian. It was always people with stormtrooper outfits and guns telling you what you could or couldn't do in a pandemic. The idea of this negotiation that this, the county comptrollers talking to the governor, talking to the people and so on and so forth. The one thing that they, that, uh, that didn't happen is the mass graves at least here in the United States. Right. Uh, contagion, contagion had the mass graves, if you recall, I mean, a horrifying scene of just lines and lines of bodies in this big tent and the bulldozers pushing the dirt over them. I've certainly seen the photos of that in other countries. Yes. There was, the there was, there was one in New York they were yes, talking yes, about. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they had converted a whole, and near many um, prisons, yeah, and mass graves. I know this is like old news, but before I was an English professor, I worked in factories and with trucks and occasionally driving even tractor trailers. And the idea that Texas has continually had to store uh, dead bodies in tractor trailers with refrigeration units terrifies me because I know how fickle those refrigeration units are. Mm. But, well, yeah, well, just the idea, I read an article um, about a guy who, you know, got a temporary job stacking bodies that they pay very well, but people don't last, being the ones who, who take the bodies from the hospital and put them in the trucks. One of the things we don't feel comfortable talking about is the need to laugh. Um, so as it turns out, when I finally got done with my summer contracts and I had a month to myself, I started writing and what came out was comedy. And uh, I thought back to my father who served in Korea and you're talking about handling all those dead bodies. He was a mechanic attached to a mass, un a mass unit for his first year. So that meant when you were stationary, his job was carrying every mutilated body that came in from the front either to the morgue or to the operating theater. And uh, what he saw was grotesque. And he said, literally, humor kept them alive. All right, laughing in the grimmest of possible circumstances. Uh, so I'm always encouraging people to laugh, uh, share your animals, even if over Zoom. Uh, pets are, are a source of, of great comfort, laughters. And we don't necessarily laugh at the pandemic, but we laugh around it and some of the things that um, appealed to us. Uh, and now and then when you're saying things, I notice uh, I'm not the only one who's got half a laugh at something so grotesque that it should not exist in modern society, but it does. And how do you re react to that except to let loose some of those emotions? Like the joke about the COVID warts. The what warts? The COVID warts. I have not heard People that. Die. People are dying to get out. Oh. oh. Evan Armwood has a comment in the chat uh, about the garbage collectors have been among the least respected essential workers in civilization. And think about that too, because as we are all, there's an interesting 
it makes me think a lot about uh, Sarah Pinkster's uh, Song for a New Day, which came out last year and won the Nebula, right? Right. And where it depicted a post-pandemic society where people were very isolated and everything is delivered by drones and people live and work at home and go to school at home and, you know, travel in isolated pods of self-driving cars. And we're almost there, almost immediately we became, and there's this kind of suburban isolationism. And, but you think about the fact that I'm like, oh, I'm not leaving my house, my nice house, I am in this. But there are people who come once a week and take away my refuse, mm -hmm. right? And there's um, people who are delivering the mail to me and people who are delivering my groceries or my pizza on game day. Cause yeah, I'm watching the Browns, even though I feel guilty because I don't think the NFL should be playing. Mm. The, we've become a work at home class and a delivery class. Mm -hmm. And with the rise of the gig economy that was already decimating workers' rights across this country, we are now relying even more on those gig workers and funneling more and more money into these large corporations that like DoorDash is downright scammy, y'all. Yeah, I know a guy that used to be a librarian and he retired and now he's a DoorDash guy. The and idea of, sorry. He's scared to do anything else. He just, he does his DoorDash and he's very careful about, you know, hand washing, even though apparently that isn't all that helpful uh you know and masks and everything like that uh and but he won't do anything else he will not come out for anything else he won't fence he won't do anything else uh but he could have been a librarian i didn't realize uh, my branch of the cuyahoga system that the uh librarians seem to be so careful there's uh first of all you can't enter without a mask they will not let you in without a mask there's a limited number of people in um and they have uh, the, the, the plastic, clear plastic barriers between you and, and the, the staff, the staff are all, I had assumed, and they sterilize the books when they come in. They're, they're kept for 48 hours and, and uh, cleansed. I don't know if it's sterilized. And I had not actually thought about that being uh, a vector of disease, but I guess it is. Paper's tough. Ours, our libraries, when they reopened, have a 96 hours and UV sterilization. So I'm a little surprised they haven't paid more attention to uh, UV sterilization. Make yeah. one comment tying what Marie and Bud said. Marie was talking about people isolating in smaller and smaller pods, and Bud was talking about the difficulty in this format, the virtual convention of meeting new people. Now, there's been a regular survey, especially of college-age students for a long time, about how many close friends do you have? And it, 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 the number dwindled to the point where the most common answer in 2006 was zero. And we have to ask, what does that mean in a sociological sense? I think, okay, how many people could just call me up and crash on my couch for a month unexplained <laughs> because they needed it? The numbers are really large, as is the number of people I could call up and crash on their couch with no explanation being needed. Mm -hmm because I'm old and gregarious and I know a lot of people, but you know, here's Bud saying, how do I meet somebody new? All I have is this, uh, is this room where the four of us can see each other. And if we get together on discord at some point or we attend other things, it is much harder to make a close friend in this format. And that is a sociological problem. It is an undermining of the base of Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, what's immediately after security of food and safety? Um, and it's right up into your social needs, so. Herb, there's so, a, a cat person has said, in the updated version of the, uh, the stand, King mentions HIV and AIDS briefly, which of course wasn't in the original. Do you think more books will mention COVID more in the future? Yeah, I do. I'm working on a uh, work for hire right now and um, like ghost writing a novel where somebody gave me the outline and I'm writing it for them. And it had a point where it's like, make a joke about the 2020s. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, and I was like, oh, that was back when everyone wore masks all the time. <laughs> 
Um, but between the time that this outline was written and now while I'm writing it, you know, uh oh, we lost Marie. Well, I'll just take that moment to say we got the 10 minute warning. So if there's questions from the attendees, it would be a great time to jump in there. I've uh, lost something you? here. My, my phone is now dead. Uh -oh. Oh, I was okay. trying to take, somebody has sent me a, do you know XKCD? Absolutely. It's a, it's a very funny thing. And unfortunately, I can't copy this. I guess I could just do copy. Somebody sent me a, a link that I, of a, here it is, xkcd.com slash two. I know, I know what it is. I know what it is, but I'd have to write it down. And, um, you can save the chat. Okay, all I have to do is get the number at 2387. How do you do that, Larry? Um, if you go into um, chat, and then at the bottom where uh, you'll see those three little dots, ah. yeah. then you can save it. It'll save it to your... Uh, I think your documents folder. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're saying so much. Ready to save this chat. Yes. Okay. The three little dots. Nice. Thank First you. First banner, Good save chat. chat. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Just Is remember not to do that again because if you do it for a different panel, it'll overwrite what you already did. Oh. So you, you need to go into the original one you saved and change the name. Thank so you. It's not a default name. So, okay. So Sorry, I, I crashed the there. Okay. okay. It's all good. Isn't that, isn't that one of those other things? What's that, bud? I said Marie's window is on her other side. <laughs> I moved because I thought maybe if I came closer to the center of the house, I'd have a stronger signal. Uh -huh. Oh, I thought you pressed that little thingy that just reversed the image. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that, can't you? Yeah. I know you can. Yes. Yeah, you can. You can, the mirror. you can mirror your image. We do have a question in the Q&A, yes. um, and I, I can read it if you'd like. Uh, sure, go right ahead. Jenny Thompson, I've been interested in the social pressure not to be safe, like wearing a mask is not manly, quote unquote, or refusing to oh. visit your grandmother in person is insulting because you're implying she's weak. Have you experienced that or seen anything in fiction that predicted that? I've definitely experienced it because I'm pretty macho. <laughs> and I had to look. the first time I tried the first time I went to wear a mask in public um like we were this was this was way early and we were like out searching for toilet paper because we ran out and I go into this CVS and I put a scarf around my face and I see nobody's wearing a mask and I immediately tear that scarf right down like oh god they're gonna think I'm well I went I'm over it I'm over it <laughs> I went into the liquor store shortly after the mask pattern appeared in the Washington Post. And the first thing I said to the guy behind the register was, I'm not here to rob the place. <laughs> yeah, like I haven't heard that before. <laughs> yeah. I actually had N95s in stock because I wear them to vacuum because I have asthma. And uh, I immediately started wearing them. But I also could care less about being macho. Um, in fact, uh, it's, it's a burden. sort of... It's, you know, I've actually had people say to me, how can you wear a pink shirt or pink, pink uh, martial arts pants? And I said, because I have no doubts. <laughs> <laughs> and they still have their issues. So uh, we but do have another. No, I can't think of anything has prepared us for that. I'm trying to think of every plague I've ever seen. And nobody's like, oh, you're a chicken and you're not going to go out there with the zombies. Nobody says that. I actually have read it usually in um, really kind of new wave uh, cyberpunk and uh, uh, steampunk. Uh, so only in short stories. I can't remember a novel where I've seen it, but I've seen all sorts of uh, kind of, I enjoy anti-authoritarian types of things. Um, we're at the five minute warning and I, we have another question that's kind of related, which is how much has science fiction prepared us for misinformation campaigns and science denial in the time of plague? So I'm thinking of Charles Obendorf's Sheltered Lives, which features a sort of AIDS-like um, terrible sexually transmitted disease. And I think we lost you again, Marie. You froze and, up. Um, I'm back. I'm going to go even further into the living room. 
was laughing. Well, this is one of the things that we've adjusted to, you know, intermittent uh, uh, stopouts or buffering or things like that. I mean, we would take this personally if we were in, in person and you just totally ignored us and froze up for a few minutes. <laughs> You know, one of the things I want, uh, we didn't mention this, I would like to have one of those robots that I could send to personal things. You know, they're, they're uh, uh, tele-operated, but they cost like $3,000. They didn't have those in any of the novels I saw. I think that science denial has certainly uh, been addressed in some science fiction, but science denial and the plague, not so much. Uh, I think when we think of science denial, those of us who, who have a pretty good sense of history know that it's very much a pendulum. And so there's times of embracing um, science and times of rejecting and denying science. But uh, that said, we have, and this is twofold, we have never has science been so valuable to humans because it's made this amazing world in this high speed fiber optic internet that I'm using. Um, and uh, the other side that's always a problem for those of us who've read science fiction for a long time is we know we should be doing better, right? We all know that humans have the ability to do far better than they're doing if we would just stop arguing and just do it, right? If we just fix the climate problem, if we just fix some of these other issues. Uh, and I always have to remind myself when I'm looking at my students, when I was their age, two thirds of the world went to bed hungry every night. And now only one third goes to bed hungry every night. As science fiction writers, we damn well know it should be zero. Yeah. But it's so much better in one lifetime. That's really amazing. <clears throat> so these are interesting ideas. And uh, uh, again, the idea of science denial at a time when science gives us so much. Uh, so much that we value, so on and so forth, and could give us so much more. You know, Ionesco's Rhinoceros is not actually a plague novel. It's sort of a plague play, but it sort of is. But it's sort of like, well, I'm not going to become a rhinoceros, and then everybody does except the narrator, and then he becomes a rhinoceros. I, uh, re regarding the, uh, the, the uh, misinformation campaigns, I heard a, an absolutely lovely... Um, Modern parable. So for the first time, once I was going to classes, I decided I could go to other things, socially distance and mask. So I went to a poetry reading. And uh, in this one, uh, the parable was that a deer was talking to a rabbit who was frantically running into the village. And the deer said, why are you running into the village? And the rabbit said, haven't you heard the rhinoceroses are killing all the giraffes? And the deer said, so why are you worried? You, my little furry friend, are most certainly not a giraffe. And the bunny looked at the deer and said, yeah, but try telling the rhinoceroses that. <laughs> Total misinformation, right? <laughs> it was, with, and, and lovely, put a way that, you know, young children could understand, but oh my gosh, it hit home so badly. We have like one minute left, so maybe if you could take, I think that was my concluding remark, if I could trouble you guys for concluding remarks, and we'll exit. So, Mary. I think the most, most interesting thing about this panel is watching Marie move around the house. <laughs> <laughs> Mary? All right. Okay, my, th my thought is that all the, uh, most of the pandemic novels I read, people survive, but it's only after terrible, terrible losses. And I think we're going to go not to terrible, terrible losses. I think we're going to have terrible losses, but not maybe terrible, terrible losses. So I think we will survive, I hope. Marie. I think that one of the things that the literature does prepare us for is, and when we write these stories, what we're writing about is human nature mm -hmm. and what aspects of human nature we choose to highlight says more about us than about what reality is going to be. That's what I'm saying. That is my sense of any number of, of established science fiction writers who say all science fiction writer is about the time in which it's written, not the future in which it's set. With that, thanks so much. I thought it was a great panel. And uh, thanks to the attendees and their questions. So.